in a natural glade of the swamp stood a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent, clear of trees and tolerably dry. On this now leaped and twisted a more indescribable horde of human abnormality than any a simi or an angolia could paint. Void of clothing, this hybrid spawn were brain bellowing and riffing about a monstrous ring-shaped bonfire, in the center of which, revealed by occasional rifts in this curtain of flame, stood a great granite monolith, some eight feet in height, on top of which, encourages in its diminutiveness rested the noxious carven statue. From a wide circle of ten scaffolds set up at regular intervals with the flame-girt monolith as the center hung head downward, the oddly marred bodies of the helpless squatters who had disappeared earlier. It was inside this circle that the ring of worshippers jumped and roared. The general direction of the mass motion began from left to right, an endless bacchanai between the ring of bodies and the ring of fire. It may have been only imagination, and it may have been only echoes which influenced one of the men, an excitable Spaniard, to fancy he heard antiphonal responses to the ritual from some far and unilluminated spot deeper within the wood of the ancient legendary and horror. This man, Joseph D. Galvez, I later met and questioned, and he proved distractingly imaginative. He indeed went so far as to hint of the faint beating of great wings, and of a glimpse of shining eyes and a mountainous white bulk beyond the remotest trees, but I suppose he had been hearing too much native superstition. Actually, the horrified pause of the men was of comparatively brief duration. Duty came first, and although there must have been nearly a hundred mongrel celebrants in the throng, the police relied on their firearms and plunged determinedly into the nauseous rout. For five minutes, the resultant din and chaos were beyond description. Wild blows were struck, shots were fired, and escapes were made. But in the end, Lagrassi was able to count some 47 sullen prisoners, whom he forced to dress in haste and fall in line between two rows of policemen. Five of the worshippers lay dead and two severely wounded ones were carried away on improvised stretchers by their fellow prisoners. The image on the monolith, of course, was carefully removed and carried back by Lagrassi. Examined at headquarters after a trip of intense strain and weariness, the prisoners all proved to be men of very low, mixed-blooded, and mentally aberrant type. Most were seamen, and a sprinkling of negroes and mulattoes, largely West Indians or Brava Portuguese from the Cape Verde Islands, gave a coloring of voodooism to the heterogeneous cult. But before many questions were asked, it became manifest that something far deeper and older than negro fetishism was involved. Degraded and ignorant as they were, the creatures held with surprising consistency to the central idea of their loathsome faith. 
be worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men, and who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but the dead bodies had told their secrets in dreams to the first men who formed a cult which had never died. This was that cult, and the prisoners said it had always existed and always would exist, hidden in the distant wastes and dark places all over the world until the time when the great priest Cthulhu, from his dark house in the mighty city of Raleigh, under the waters, should rise and bring the earth again beneath his sway. Some day he would call when the stars were ready and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. Meanwhile, no more must be told. There was a secret even the tortured could not extract. Mankind was not absolutely alone among the conscious things of the earth, for shapes came out of the dark to visit the faithful few, but these were not the great old ones. No man had ever seen the great old ones. The carven idol was great Cthulhu, but none might say whether or not the others were precisely like him. No one could read the old writing now, but things were told by word of mouth. The ritual chanting was not the secret. That was never spoken aloud, only whispered. The chant meant this only. In his house at Raleigh, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Only two of the prisoners were found sane enough to be hanged and the rest were committed to various institutions, all denied a part in the ritual murders, and averred that the killing had been done by black-winged ones, which had come to them from their immemorable meeting place in the haunted wood. But of those mysterious allies, no coherent account could ever be gained. What the police did extract came mainly from the immensely aged Mazito named Castro, who claimed to have sailed to strange ports and talked with undying leaders of the, cow of the cult in the mountains of China. Old Castro remembered bits of hideous legend that paled the speculations of theosophists and made man and the world seem recent and transient indeed. There had been eons when other things ruled the earth and they had great cities. Remains of them, he said, the deathless Chinamen had told him, were still to be found as Cyclopean stack stones on the islands in the Pacific. They all died in vast epochs of time before men came, but there were arts which could revive them when the stars had come round again to the right positions in the cycle of eternity. They had indeed come themselves from the stars and brought their images with them. These great old ones, Castro continued, were not comprised altogether of flesh and blood. They had shape, for did not this star-fashioned image prove it? But that shape was not made of matter. When the stars were right, they could plunge from world to world through the sky, but when the stars were wrong, they could not live. But although they no longer lived, they never really would die. They all lay in stone houses in the great city of Raleigh, preserved by the spells of mighty Cthulhu,
for a glorious resurrection, when the stars and the earth might once more be ready for them.